Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs Podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. Hey, we're back with the Maryland Crabs. How are you, Tim? I'm dandy. Good. Hey, this week we brought somebody in to talk with. Uh, we're going to talk politics. This might be the endorsement issue. We're going to see who's endorsing who, who's a trumpet and who's not. Um, but we have Kenneth Burns, who is a journalist, longtime journalist. He's currently on WYPR. Mm-hmm. And he has been covering Baltimore for... Ever. He's been in Annapolis. He was at WNAV for a number of years, WTOP. Uh, I know he put his hat in the ring to be the spokesperson for the Annapolis Police Department, so he knows the Annapolis area and certainly Baltimore for the last three years. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Kenny. Thank you for having me. All right. I've always known him as Kenny, and he's got this whole professional P. Kenneth thing going, <laughs> so we're going to go with Kenny for the rest. Is that okay? Not a problem. Okay. <laughs> Kenneth is just the byline. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, well, what we want to do, we want to talk, well, okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room here. What the hell happened with Stephanie Rollins Blake here? Kenny was. Hold on, I need my agent. They said we wouldn't <laughs> talk about this. <laughs> That's why we brought you by in the, in deep into the woods where, where it's not a. Uh, I love a good blind side. <laughs> right. Um, uh, you know, no, I mean, you can't talk about it. I mean, Stephanie, for those that aren't, aren't aware, uh, Stephanie Rollins Blake had an issue with a reporter in City Hall and essentially banned him from her future press conferences, private press conferences after meetings, um, because he was threatening, which he wasn't. And that is... Uh, I'm that guy. I'm looking at you. <laughs> You're one of the least threatening people I've ever... No, I, just, I just want to give you a hug. We're not. <laughs> but I could. We can hug afterwards, but... Ooh. I mean... <laughs> I'm, it, the whole thing's unfortunate. Um, and you could go back to the Charm TV YouTube channel. That's the government access channel in Baltimore because those briefings are broadcast over cable access. Right. And as far as I'm concerned, the exchange that I had with her on October 5th was characteristic when I have to probe a little bit. Uh, and the question involved how much say she has over the city police department because the city police department is a state agency. And, oh, by the way, the Baltimore uh, City Police Department and, is, in essence, uh, city officials, they're negotiating this uh, consent decree with the Justice Department because they found patterns or practices that violated the civil rights of citizens, African-American citizens in particular. So, obviously, this was this is a, a really big deal. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, it was just ridiculous. She just didn't want to answer the questions that uh, was posed to her, and that, that was the, the easy way out because I'm the mayor. I can I can throw you out because I say so, and she's only got another month or so. so right. And can I understand, too, but this is not abnormal for her, is that oftentimes she won't answer a question in a press room conference that she wants to get back to a particular site. So from what I understand, it's not uncommon for so, but it, it's also not what you consider to be. And you come across the ironic part in this because during the Freddie Gray anniversary, one of my stories was on his being, or make that her being uh, combated with the media at times, not just me, but other reporters in the city. Oh, she absolutely was. I remember during that whole thing. Right. Was, uh, She'll say that you're editorializing or you see the cup half empty. And actually, I have that soundbite in uh, my story from earlier this year. And I think that's what we want. And once we're done with this, we want to parlay this into a larger uh, view about how people regard the press and the media in general. Is that, you know, do you feel you're being attacked when they're actually doing their job? Oh, I I have some things to say about the media, oddly enough. Uh, (laughs) But keep in mind, she said it wasn't a question. It was my alleged physically and verbally threatening behavior, particularly to her staff. Which is, uh, I mean, my boss never received a complaint or a phone call about my behavior at City Hall. Keep that in mind. They just uh, haven't seen you out at the bars at night. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other thing to keep in mind is 
I'm just banned from that one news conference where that takes place after the Board of Estimates. She said this, and her spokesman, Anthony McCarthy, said it as well in an email. I could come to anything else. Right, it's just, a, nice. it's just a private one mm-hmm. for strictly the media. Right, after which, the, which yeah, was which, taken off the public schedule a lot recently. Like, <laughs> Stephanie Rollins, Blake, if you ever listen to this, you're a big baby. Chill out. You know, yes. you're mayor, mayor of one of the largest cities in the country. You're never going to be able to park in Baltimore again. Grow up. <laughs> oh my I do not share his view. Kenny does not share his view because we are mature. I think you're doing a great job. I'm just a guest. Yeah, <laughs> grow, grow up, grow up, grow up. Um, but that takes it to, you know, it, and I had this, uh, I was just talking to John before we started, is that I just have no self-control. So I go online and I comment after stories, which is the most evil thing that has ever happened to media in general is the ability to comment after stories on uh, on websites or mm-hmm. even Facebook because the anonymity, and John and I disagree with this, I think the anonymity behind it is bullshit because it emboldens people to say things that they would never say face-to-face. And, and I know... I've talked to some reporters like, oh, I don't pay attention. Of course they pay attention. You know, I call they, it keyboard courage. Exactly, yeah, the keyboard warriors. Right. You, you're you brave enough to hide behind a keyboard, make up a name, and say vile, nasty, horrible things, but you don't have enough courage to put your name on it, well, your real name. And that brings it to, you know, when you look at, at, it gives you an interesting perspective as to what people think about the press. And, and if you ask most people to say, well, the press is, I mean, that, this is why... Trump has, has gotten as far as he did. It's him versus the press, and people dis, distrust the press. It, it, it's, it's statistically in all polls, and you wonder: is that because the the, the press has gotten worse? Are they partisan? Um, you know, are, are they super liberal, um, or is it the fact that if you don't agree with what's written, then all of a sudden they, that it's partisan? For example, you know, Trump says that that the, that he's been picked on by the press, and that's part of a broader conspiracy. But you know the mayor is certainly not conservative, and she's not uh, you know she she's democratic, and you know so the fact that when she look at the press, they won't be attacked by the press simply because it's not the press that she wants. And is it has the press actually gone off its its core mission, or has its just perspective that you have every, with the identity politics as it is right now? Everybody, uh, if you don't agree with the press, then it's part of a conspiracy. It's definitely uh, identity politics at play. We're talking about multiple layers of stuff. You, in the history of history of politicians and the modern media, if you write or report something that they don't like, you don't like them, you're picking on them, you're not being fair. If you happen to write something that they love, oh, you're a good reporter and all that stuff. That That has always been around even before the age of the internet, let alone Twitter. And there's never been, uh, there's always been an antagonistic, and that's by design, actually. The fourth estate is supposed to, is called that, I think it, it comes from a British meaning that it's, a, it's an unofficial group that has some sort of authority, an un, un, unnamed authority. And so the press is the fourth estate, that their job is, is to be antagonistic with government officials to be basically an ombudsman. And, and basically what, and I brought up that point uh, earlier this week uh, with college students. I was speaking in D.C. at a class at uh, Trinity, Washington. The press is the only industry specifically named in the Constitution. Mm-hmm. They just didn't give us any money to do our job, so we have to figure out our way. With that said, part of the problem are, in my opinion, is the cable networks. Uh, MSNBC, Fox News Channel, CNN. Those are your big three, right? Right. And well, I, CNN, I think we have more listeners than CNN has viewers, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, they, and they are, I mean, they are in a world of hurt. I mean, I'm going and, off track. but and, Well, part of that was Fox News Channel because they came out fair and balanced. We will report the truth and you will decide if it's the truth and all this stuff. And, Fo- and CNN was really caught sleeping. Uh Around the time that Fox News Channel started to build up its audience, Fox, the network, started to own among the largest local television station groups in the country. They own DC. Uh, they own stations in DC, as we all know, uh, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, Dallas, all the major markets. All, and yeah, all all the major markets. Now they just took over uh, San Francisco, and they and because of FCC rules. Local stations can ask for recons- or retransmission agreements. This gives permission of the uh, local cable systems to retransmit the local station on their system. And the cable systems have to pay for that. And the way these agreements work out is, and Fox used this to their benefit. I'm not begrudging oh, them at the least. Rupert Murdoch is brilliant. Right. 
So let's say you want to put Fox Five on uh, Burns Cablevision. Okay, you could you could carry Fox Five, but you have to cover you have to carry FX. You have to oh, carry gosh. Fox News Channel, Fox Movie Channel. You have to carry FXX, which has long drawn out Simpson marathons, for which I am greatly appreciative. I was going to say, so what's the problem? There? Well, the, right. The problem is, is that when you look at, for example, there's always a war with Cox in Northern Virginia, and you always see that in WTTG, right. where they say, um, you know, the commercial is, well, the, uh, uh, Cox Cable is trying to take the Redskins away from you. You know, call them up, let them know you won't have that. They're not trying to take the Redskins from you. They're not agreeing to the agreement that the Fox that you know Fox says you have to carry our entire package. Right. right. And they're they're five hundred pound gorillas. Fox News, which is a massive property. It's it's. I mean, Rupert they're Murdoch, a billion dollar network. R- Rupert Murdoch in ninety six, he was a genius because he looked and said the baby boomers are getting older, and the baby boomers are eighty one million people. So as you get older, what do you do? You get more conservative. And he was brilliant. He goes, why don't I just package this? up because he didn't tap into a bunch of conservatives that didn't have an outlet. Baby boomers became conservative. They were the, the free love hippies in the 60, in 69 avoiding the Vietnam draft. And they're the same ones in the invasion of Iraq. We thought that was a damn good idea. Right. You know, so I'm not, I'm not picking, well, I am picking on them, but I mean, <laughs> but, but, but he's a genius that he, he packaged identity politics. And, and if you, like, if you go to Fox News right now, the web, website, I guarantee you, you look at the equivalent to above the fold. Every single article is is pro Trump slash anti Hillary. Every single one. I don't begrudge them because that's their market. That's what they're doing. And exactly. And Fox is basically busted CNN in the mouth. They CNN was caught sleeping. Destroyed and then, them. It it literally did. And now CNN is playing the same game as Fox News Channel. MSNBC is playing the same game as Fox News Channel. And from my personal perspective. National media, and I talked about this last night, um, disclaimer, vice president of the Maryland Professional Chapter Society of Professional Journalists, we had a panel about this. The national media had their own narrative set. They, When you had those acquittals in the uh, Freddie Gray case trials, they were expecting something to burn. Nothing they were hoping nothing They were hoping burn. something would burn. And then we had the incident, I think it was after the Goodson trial, uh, MSNBC had the graphics talk about happening, happening now. They had the split screen yeah. with the pundit and the riot footage from last year. You know, it's funny to talk about that. I, what prior life, I used to do some little bit of reporting with MSNBC, and we covered a little bit of the recovery of Katrina a year mm-hmm. later. Ran across Greta Van Susteren's crew in the middle of an esplanade, and there was a big, huge pothole. <laughs> and they were filling it with water, and she had boots to stand in it. Oh, my God. And I'm, I'm like... Really? So we were with the crew. I said, just walk through their shot. Just walk. <laughs> well, see, that's interesting. You know, so just keep going back. I said, that's just wrong. I said, you want to go in and get an alligator and throw it into you know, right. a stuffed I worked, alligator? I worked in TV news uh, in Albuquerque, so we were a smaller market, and I worked for the CBS affiliate and the NBC affiliate um, down there. And they were not owned They were not owned and operated. Right. They were, so um, I watched a reporter get fired once um, because... We did a story on someone had claimed that they found chicken bones in milk, a little container of milk. So to illustrate that point, the reporter, they bought the milk and they bought the chicken bones and they, they put it in, not to create a story, but to illustrate what the person claimed. It was mm-hmm. essentially a reenactment. She got canned and she should have gotten canned. That was just, that was an incredible breach of, of professional etiquette. Um, it was something stupid to do. But I think it shows that, you know, I, I think we look at the, the, the media and reporters and, and journalists, and by the way, a lot of the people you see on TV, uh, these, these reporters around, aren't trained journalists. They're not. A lot of them have, they had to look. They, they started off from the bottom, and, you know, so they're trained to write in there, so that they're not trained as journalists. And there is a big difference with that. But you will see there are breaches of, of, of I think, I don't think it's conspiracy, but there are times when I think that the media as a whole is, is acting in, in, in uh, bad faith when it comes to the public interest. I, I mean, if you say, if you look at... at Barack Obama's election in, in 2008 versus Hillary Clinton, were they kind to him and hard on her? I think they were. I, I think that they really, and I think looking past, they were kind of sheepishly agreed that maybe they gave him kind of a bit of a pass because they got caught up in it. I mean, it's possible to get caught up in something. And like Kenny just said, yeah, I mean, they were hoping for, for fires for that, for that, uh, for, for the riot. You know? they, they, they were. And if it bleeds, it leads. It, and I think we've gotten away from actually reporting what happened, particularly for television, radio, not so much because we don't have to worry about images except taking the picture for the website. <clears throat> Pardon me. <laughs> so all that to say, and, and I'm going to talk about Trump and the cable networks in a second. 
we it's it's like the cable networks they're more interested in pictures and certain basically putting train wrecks on the air on a regular basis than they are informing. I remember growing up watching CNN. I, uh, for the record, grew up in Prince George's County, and it was news. It was straight. I mean, it was like watching a, my local newscast only on a national scale. Now it's swooshing graphics. Yeah. Um, Fox News doesn't come back. I'm not picking on them, but every time they come back from commercial, they have that clanging bell of breaking news. Right. That's it. That's it's not breaking news. This is a Fox News alert. It's not. I mean, they, they knew that I mean, that that news is four hours right. old. You know, it's just it, that's part of the package that you're talking right. about. There's a Fox affiliate in Kentucky that did away with breaking news because most of the time, the breaking news really isn't breaking. It's more like this just in or we're learning of. Right. But it, it it it's not breaking news. Uh, but a lot of stations built their reputation on breaking news and. It, we we need to, as an industry, and I've said this uh, publicly as well, we need to sit down and say, okay, how can we better organize it? Because there's some stuff that's an emergency and some stuff that isn't. Well, you know what's interesting? And again, i got to say I'm not picking on Fox News, but I mean, they, they are they are redesigning what how, far, how how journalism is done, that it's a business and it's it's a package that you want to appeal that to a conservative audience. I'm not saying, well, it is bad, but I mean, but it's part of the business. But I will say one thing that they've done recently that goes into that breaking news sort of bucket is that they, um, uh, they will report on a, on a breaking news uh, situation, but they report what people are saying on Twitter. They're always saying, we're seeing on Twitter, we're hearing on Twitter, and that's because, you know, I'm a big social media guy, so right. when something's breaking, like, say, the shootings in Paris, I went right to Twitter and clicked on my news feed so I could follow it all, and that moves very, very fast. So I think what happens is that you have uh, the, the TV, maybe radio, certainly newspaper, they're falling behind with the reporting because they're trying to verify, and, and people who are on Twitter don't have to do that. So it's right. easy to fall on that track when, hey, we're looking stupid because we're not getting, putting out any new information, so let's go to see what's happening on Twitter. And you can't do that. that uh, it's lazy reporting, and you would think we would have learned years ago when you had that unfortunate incident in Arizona, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords got shot. Right, a uh, serious injury, and they were reporting her demise, and then they had to, everyone had to walk it back. CNN was the uh, corporate in that one, mm-hmm. and Twitter is great. I'm I'm on Twitter at PKB News. It's like it's like a police scanner. Every it gives you clues. It's, it's reading the tea leaves, but it's not exactly. It doesn't mean that it's actually happening. It's just I, a tool. I, I get that with Ian and Apple a lot. People are like, well, how do you know this? I said, well, I use Twitter a lot, and I know certain things. I mean, if you're, if you're going up the road and you say, hey, there's a car overturned on 665, I know you personally. I can say, okay, well, at PPK News, right. knows his, knows his stuff. So I put a lot more stake in you telling me that than just some random person saying, oh, there's a car overturned. Right. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's a little bit about betting that. I mean, it, it really sort of broke, I guess, when Sully landed that plane in the in the Hudson. It was when Twitter really sort of came into its thing as a news. I mean, that's the first place I go whenever there's breaking news is, is I go to Twitter to see exactly what people are saying. But like you said, it's there's it's very fluid at the time. So it's very fluid, but, and you still have to vet it out. Nothing, nothing has changed. We just added another layer to our work. Well, it's. I think. I think when you look at the tools that they have available, I think that maybe there's a panic with the news media, especially newspaper, because everything everyone expects everything so fast that if it's not provided right away, that people they're worried that they're not going to be viable anymore as a news organization. So you, it becomes sloppy, and I, I look at everybody for that. Well, uh, and Charlie, I have to credit Charlie LaDuff, who is a former New York Times reporter turned TV reporter. I have to credit him for saying this. Newspapers got a little arrogant. Yeah. Because they were giving the stuff away for free, except for the Wall Street Journal. They said, okay, you want to read our stuff online, you have to pay nineteen ninety five a month. They which, did that which early is fair. on. Content doesn't come for free. So no. People have to be paid but, for that. But Washington Post, Baltimore Sun, all your major dailies, they were giving the product away. And that really did a job. And now they're playing catch up. And it's like, wait a minute. Everything on the internet is free. So it's going to take them some time to relearn the populace so they could pay for their content. Who do you like? Like, you, 
do you look at the industry that you're like, that's my guy, or that's my the, the woman that I that I like? Like, who do you see that exemplifies what you think journalism should be? Charlie the Duck for sure. And yes, I've seen the YouTube videos. That's why I like him because he he entertains. He but he doesn't go over the line. He and his reporting is solid. Jay Miller is another one. Jay Miller from WBAL TV. And it, it's a real throw for me that I get to uh, work with her as a colleague uh, covering city government. And I remember uh, there was... She's real hard-hitting. I, like, I, I do like Jane. A- anybody that can nail the same guy in an I-team report 20 years later... <laughs> <laughs> there's something to be said there's about There's something that. to be said about that. I'm a huge Matt Taibbi fan, uh, Rolling Stone. He's, oh, yeah, he's he good. Is, he, they don't, no one does investigative journalism anymore. And that's how I felt with Fox whenever Fox said, hey, you know, the, the the mainstream media is not covering this. They're not covering that. They're not they're not digging this. I'm like, why don't you do that? Why don't you have? They had a Brett Baer investigative report on the military uh, about a month ago that was hellacious. It was riddled with inaccuracies and it was I mean it was propagandic. And I'm just saying, you know, if you're going to do investigative reporting, do proper investigative reporting. But very few people do that anymore. And Matt Taibbi to me is old school with that. He's amazing. The stories he's broken has been spectacular. Mm-hmm. And, and it's really sad that if that's going away. And I don't know what was causing that. I don't know if it's people don't see the value and don't see the value of it. Well, it's going to be just budgetary. I mean, look at the capital. I mean, let's, let's be honest. The capital's been gutted. And, and there's some really good reporters there, but there's very few of them, you know, and they just, I don't think that they have the chance to go in depth. Uh, what, was, what was his name that we liked a lot that, uh, um, on, at, at the Capitol, um, who, uh, went, uh, Ed Hartley, Ed Hartley. Eric Hartley. Eric, Eric Hartley. Hartley. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was great. I mean, he was, he was irritating. He was annoying. People, he pissed people off and he was a great reporter. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he was very, very confrontational. He was very, I mean, th- and that's the job of a reporter. Right. It is, it is it, definitely the job of a reporter, but the problem is, Who's going to back them up? Because remember, we don't. We have to, in my case, public media. We have to go hand in hand to the federal government or whatever foundation that has money. Commercial entities they sell commercials, oh, yeah. right. and if you do, and ABC did a story about this. If you did a story about Ford and how crappy their vehicles are, Ford might not be happy, and they might pull advertising in at that point. And we did have that. I've been, that was like years ago that I worked in news, but we did have times where the sales manager would come over and say, hey, we got to talk. Right. You know, and, and, but there's a realism. There's, I, idealistically, you're like, we can't do that. We're a news organization. They're looking at you going, did they pay your paycheck? You know, I, said, I mean, you got to be realistic about that. I mean, John, John has Ida Annapolis, and you've broken some stories here locally. But we're a small town, you know, so, so for you, you risk alienating either potential advertisers um, right. or you, you risk alienating people for whom you have to work to get information, you know, PIOs. Or right, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, it's, it's a balancing act. And, right. and a lot of times, I mean, I will not, uh, you know, I, the whole thing like my mom used to say, you know, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say, so, say, say something nice. I mean, if, if it's a true story, okay, let's, let's look at Volkswagen. Uh, with their picture Trent lately, with their, you, know, <laughs> you know, there's no escaping that. Uh, if all of a sudden, uh, you know, the paint was peeling off of the cars, off of a dozen cars in the Mid Atlantic region, okay, yeah, it's a story. Um, is it a real big story that needs to be covered? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, and if that was me, I might shy off of the paint thing for not, you know, stirring that pot. But you know, with the whole emissions thing, you'd have you've really got to go with it. I mean, it's 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 a it's a tough. It, every, to toe. Everything's a balancing act, which is why I spend an inordinate amount of time reading and researching everything. That's how I came up with uh, the questions about the police department, as well as all the other stories. Um, if you really want a good story, and you really want to make sure that all your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted, you're going to have to take time to do the research. And go going back to the time issue, many places... They want you to be out there getting something on the air, even if it's not fully vetted. I had a friend of mine just talking about rattling cages, and he was in Jersey, and he graduated college. We were both journalism majors, and he got a job at some uh, daily out there. And this is before email and anything. I ran into him a couple years later. He said the day that he knew he made it, he was doing a story on organized crime in, in respect to uh, trash contracts. And he said he got three death threats one night, and he was just elated. Wow. He, just, <laughs> he said, he goes, I knew I made it. I'm like, I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Hey, uh, well, we talked about, you know, the media and the media's influence and, and advertisers and whatnot. Trump, 
has also been screaming about how you know the media has been rigged against him and whatnot. I mean, it was which is funny because the media at one point was rigged for him. Yeah, he, yeah. He got so by some estimates, I think it's high. They're saying a billion dollars worth if you monetize how much free airtime he's gotten. He's got a billion dollars worth of airtime in the last eighteen months. Um, and, and yeah, I would say he, he's gotten. He, I'm not saying he's getting a pass because he says very stupid things, but it's not a lack of coverage. Yeah, I would I would say that. I mean, the debate. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the debate the other night. Uh, and this will air off. By the way, later. Chris Wallace, who was an excellent reporter, I knew he was going to be going to that. He was phenomenal. He was just absolutely oh, yeah. amazing. He was absolutely fair. Had he not been a Fox News contributor and Fox News anchor, he would have been accused of being in the tank for Hillary. He would have been accused of... of well, he was accused of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Trump came out and said that he gave... He, he, he's accused him of giving her the questions beforehand. I don't know if they clarified that. I thought that he was referring to a previous... That the town hall, hall debate, that Donna Brazil got the question that, for that. that. That too, but you know, he came out right and said that it was... Uh, that Chris Wallace had done it. And to be honest with you, I sat there and I looked at the... We'll call it, for lack of a better word, the Fox debate... Uh, as a little bit more of a balancing act. I mean, I did think that the MSNBC one... His was far... Which was the very first one, and then it was like, oh, so what's your favorite color, Hillary? And Donald, tell me about the wall. (laughs) You know, I mean, it was... I I hate those debates because of those questions. And and I think the Fox debate, I think, really asked Hillary some of the tough questions. And went a little bit lighter on Trump than, than Hillary, I thought. And now Trump. I, I thought it was fair. I thought it was absolutely fair. the way he had, and I knew it was going to be. Chris Wallace is a damn good uh, mm-hmm. uh, journalist, he, he, and I knew he would be. To your point, I think that the other one. I mean, people say, "Well, we want to hear about the debates." They don't really. They wanted to hear what they heard in the first two debates, and, and I think that that the the moderators were okay. And I don't, I don't want think to walk it back before even the debates, and, and even the debates during the primary. Let's talk about the free advertising he received, and all of the years that I've watched politics. I've never seen as many television producers allow a presidential candidate to phone it in. Yeah, I, I mean that that was it never happened. It, usually, they tell you to be at a certain spot. There's a camera waiting for oh, you. You mean, li- you mean literally, literally, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, but he phoned it in a, at the drop of the hat. Fox, ABC. Uh, now credit to CBS. And the only time I heard them phone it in was when. Uh, Antonin Scalia died. Okay. But other than that, CBS, I think, was the only network that did not allow Donald Trump to phone it in because they said, this is television. This is not radio. Yeah, here's the problem, though, is that if I'm a producer and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, you know, I, I have uh, someone run up and go, hey, we got, we got Donald Trump on the line right now. He want, I mean, I got to figure, do I, how do I justify that to my news director that I just said, okay, I had him, but I, I would, yes, but, I but know. You take, that. you take that if, that's a, if, if he all of a sudden calls in. I mean, obviously you take it, but if you're trying to set something up, don't accept a call in. But I'll say this too: is that for all this complaining, and I look at Fox News, who's totally in the tank for him right now. But but nine months ago, they were because I went to the Wayback Machine on on. Oh, they were fisticuffs. Yeah, they were. They were actually <laughs> they were appalled the fact that he'd gotten far. So they were destroying him. I would say they were harder on him than most other media. It wasn't until he became the candidate that also they're like, all right, we're in. So I mean, I, I just find it funny that that the same people who were saying he's unfit and that they were taking him apart are now in the tank for him. So. And I think when they say fair and balanced, what they mean is that they're balancing out the, the, the liberal media so that they, not that they are balanced themselves, but they are the, balance, the counterbalance to right. the liberal media. But, um, and, and I, but I would say that if you look, people say, well, they're, all they're doing is reporting on his gas. Like, but you, you can't not report on the things he says. You can't. I, yeah. How can you ignore that? And which, which, is, which brings up another point. He says some stupid stuff. And... This is the first time in recent memory that you had a candidate for any office that denied saying something that you have on tape. <laughs> yeah, he said that about the when someone they they said you well he was he was calling them out saying look well, at the sex support, tape the support in Iraq the sex tape yeah but he goes he goes they said go he said he tweeted go look at her sex tape because I never said that I'm like I'm looking at the goddamn tweet right <laughs> you didn't I don't understand that that's what. So I, I think he's gotten a pass. I, I'll tell you another thing too, and I anyone can file a lawsuit, but he he's being sued for sexual assault of a twelve year old girl. He is that that is in, in civil court, mind you. Um, he's filed twice. It's been dismissed twice because of filing errors. It's been refiled for a third time, and he ha- they have a court date again, civil court. I'm not saying he did it. I'm not saying he didn't, but it has been very underreported. It's a, you know it, if you're doing these equivalencies for both. Because uh, they would accuse the mainstream media of not reporting on the WikiLeaks enough, which which I think is nonsense. They right. Are. Um, 
and uh, in some cases using what WikiLeaks had uh, leaked out. Like the email. WikiLeaks, Tim and I were talking a little bit earlier yeah. on that. Uh, what What are your thoughts on WikiLeaks? Valid source, not? It is a double-edged sword because basically this guy is stealing it as if it was me, I would go to the proper channels, i.e. Uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. Well, yeah, but, but I mean, I think leaks are valid. Uh, but I guess my problem is, and I'll, I'll let you go forward with it, but <clears throat> my problem is this, and I get this, I can't take credit for this, I'm a huge Dan Carlin fan. Okay. Yeah, he has, uh, Con- Dan Carlin's Common Sense is the best podcast you listen to, and he has a hardcore history one, too. But he was talking about WikiLeaks, and, and I agree, I think I think sh- Sunshine, no matter how you get it, even if it's illegal, that, that the press is entitled to have that information, they put it out. However, we don't know we don't know where it's coming from. You know, that that's the one side. And so let's say that the Russians, and it's highly likely, if not almost certain, that, that it is the Russians who are releasing this. They're not just releasing the information. Can they not also alter that information? It's absolutely possible. Because because you have to look at the other side. It's all been one-sided. So I believe that we should have these WikiLeaks, and we should examine them. We should see what, what, what uh, Secretary Clinton has, uh, what she talked about going up to the campaign and her staff. But I want to see the Republican ones as well, so we can weigh that. I, I think that that's that is where. No, no that no, I'm I'm 100 with you. If you're going to do for one and claim fairness, you have to do it for the and other. And I think it is valid. I think we should see these 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 uh, WikiLeaks. Right. But, and, I, but I I question the reason we're getting them. Andrea. Uh, uh, that's why I always say tread lightly. Exactly. Julia Assange. I mean, he's. I don't know if he has an axe to grind, uh, but certainly the Russians they they do not want Secretary Clinton and, and uh, elected president. So, and it's obvious that it's them, absolutely obvious. So that's where you have to question going, why are they so interested in having all this information, which, if true, it's a valid questions that have to be asked. Right. And keep in mind, Russia's the, uh, the suspect. But I remember a time when Mitt Romney said Russia's the next biggest problem and everyone was accusing him of living back in the 80s. And he was right. He was 100% right at that as far as existential threats. He was 100% right about that and everyone laughed at him. And now that's where, I get, where you look at Trump and you look at everyone going, oh, they're not a problem. Don't you want to make peace? I'm like, wait a minute. Four years ago, your guy said that they were the largest existential threat including terrorism, including global warming, everything. They were number one. And he was right about that. Um, but but now, no, not a problem. It's, it's not an issue. But I know. <laughs> but we're, we're tracing the servers right now, and, and and you have, what, 10, 12 different government agencies saying it is the Russians. And they're not our enemies per se, but they're certainly our rivals. And they're saying, if your rival wants you to do something, don't do that thing. We right. don't know why they're, they, want the, they're, they have this information out there. But I think it takes some extra vetting to figure out what it's all about. And exactly my point. I mean, I mean, this this is just like TMZ and the uh, Ray Rice video. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the record, I think TMZ is scummy <laughs> uh, because of how they slow roll the tape. If it was me, I would have put everything out. But they, but uh, TMZ probably cost Ray Rice's job because they didn't release the entire video. Right. Well, that's their model. Well, but, but it's interesting because you have to look at that. I mean, and I think that if you look at Glenn, uh, Glenn Greenwald with the um, Snowden uh, files, mm-hmm. that's what was brilliant about it. And you can look at Glenn Greenwald and you can call him a dirtbag, which he is, and you know, but mm-hmm. he, he's also very brilliant and he's a good journalist. And what he did was instead of dumping everything at once, is that he put one thing out and the, the, the Clinton or the uh, Obama administration say, nope, it's not true, it's not true. And you go, oh, all right, well, here's the next one. That right. contradicts exactly <laughs> what. And this went on for months. And people are going, why is he holding it back? I mean, some of it is showmanship. Some of it is, uh, is uh, you know, extending the, the length of the story. But also was that he let them dangle and, and let the government officials hang themselves. And he put out another one that contradicts that. That was brilliant journalism. Right. You know the, the the Snowden thing, the the Glenn Greenwald. It was, that was that's what journalism is all about. And you can disagree with it. Um, you can disagree. I've heard people. It's like, all about motive. Well, yes, and I had I, the conservatives are ready to have Julian Assange executed on sight. You know, right. until he started releasing the Hillary Clinton the Hillary stuff, Trump. and then all of a sudden they're cool with him. It's funny how we all become good friends with other people we don't like when they start working our well, sure. Stuff. If you look at and liberals, and if you look at like uh, for example, um, Bill Maher. You know, he, he thinks that that uh, that Edward Snowden should be tried for tried for treason. For this, and I'm thinking, well, this if this happened during the Bush administration. You'd be hailing hell, him as a hero and calling for a pardon, right? You know, and it goes to what Kenny's saying is that it comes down to, and and the press in general, is it your guy? MSNBC did this. MSNBC ticked me off so much when they're talking about the Patriot Act because they were railing against the Patriot Act, which they should have been all during the Bush administration, saying what a travesty it was and what how un-American, unconstitutional. They actually said 
that when it, when it was expanded under President Obama, they said, well, we can trust him. And I'm like, oh, you can trust your guy. You know, like that. They actually said that. Oh, my they God. They said, we can trust him with these. We couldn't trust the Bush administration, but it's okay now because it's our guy. That's appalling to me. That's BS. That's see, bull. see I, I just proved I don't watch cable networks that often, and that's why, because... It's the that was Chris Matthews, of course. Of course. That the, it all depends on which person they like is in power. And that's not the object to, that's not the objective of journalism. Journalism is supposed to be non discriminatory. Whether you like them or not, you have to tell the truth about them. Um, I said I wasn't going to delve with it in this anymore. I don't have anything personal against the mayor of Baltimore. I really don't. It's, I just had questions and if if I always ask the question she likes, then in journalism that's a problem. You're not doing your job, that's right? Like, people have to realize that that's a, that's your job we're, to do that. We're not we're not anybody's drinking buddies. We work together. Yes. Do we need to uh, f- uh, figure stuff out? Yes. But as far as trying to be everybody's best friend, that's not our job. So there was an argument on Facebook, I don't know if you saw this, it was a mutual friend of ours, and, mm-hmm. and uh, he is he teaches uh, internet journalism classes and everything, like Josh. Yeah. And he had someone, and I, I never get, first of all, I don't get into Facebook battles, because no one's ever going, hey, you make a good point, you changed my mind. This doesn't, <laughs> it's never happened. But the other part of it was, uh, I don't get into it on someone, on like a friend, like, there's nothing worse than when two of your friends get on a battle on your Facebook right, page. Right, right. And uh, so I rarely do that, but this guy, but we were talking about you mm-hmm. and the hashtag free Kenny that was, that was going around. That was, that was great. By the and, way, that was trending for, yeah, like, for a while. Like an afternoon or, or yeah, they, and I thought, well, I thought something different. I'm like, Ooh, I'm not gonna have to pay for him. This is awesome. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, but what the argument was, was the guy, and apparently he's, and I apologize to Josh, I'm like, anyway, I don't know the guy, but he, his point was that press conferences are stupid anyway. They don't serve any purpose whatsoever. So what's the point of having them? I and we got this protracted... It was civil, but we got this battle where I'm saying, you're out of your mind. I don't think I said politely, but I'm like, you're out of your mind. There's so many things that, that historically have gone... Uh, that, that have been revealed in press conferences with reporters pressing. The good reporters pressing hard. You know, everything from you know, Norman Schwarzkopf uh, in, in the first Gulf War. Mm-hmm. Um, when you had uh, uh, certainly... Um, weapons of mass destruction and the yellow cake uh, uranium and all these are all things that good reporters in press conferences push for a lot that's where all the action is made but that's where also where you see the sausage being made right is that it may be unpleasant you're going why, why is he badgering her or what he's not badgering him he's doing his job she's not answering the question I'm not picking on her I'm saying this I mean I, you see it happen all the time that you're going to see a contentious relationship all of a sudden turn I don't, I don't know why anyone would want to be a White House spokesperson that well, just I mean that's why they go go pay so quick right you know? <laughs> And, and also keep in mind, more in general, we're starting to see more of these orchestrated press events that make people look good. We probably see it more in presidential election years than, any, than anywhere else. Uh, you never, you you rarely see anybody at, actually I don't think I see, I've seen anybody uh, this year try to uh, interrupt in, like Hillary or, uh, well we've seen numerous interruptions with Trump early on, but we don't really see them like uh, we used to. I remember uh, was I want to say it was Carly. This was four years ago. Um, anyway, Chris Christie was out stumping for somebody, and someone got up and decided to heckle the person Chris Christie was boosting. And Christie right. got off the stage and told him, "Look, we're going to act civil here." I mean that that's the stuff. I mean that's that's your newsmaker moment. <laughs> right. True. I, I don't, but I mean, it's just, there is supposed to be an antagonistic relationship between the press. I mean, not uncivil, but I mean, it's supposed to be, like you said, it's, you know, as the fourth estate, the ombudsman, is that that's their job is to hold their feet to the flame and say, you know, I, I think people should be more confrontational with Hillary Clinton because she has not answered a lot of questions uh, about, about uh, Goldman Sachs. Right. She's not answered a lot of questions about um, some of the WikiLeaks. You know, and someone had a good point saying, you know, because I'm I'm of the mind saying you have to be careful with WikiLeaks because they may not be valid because they can be edited, they can be altered, they can be invented. Mm-hmm. But some someone uh, for Fox News had a great point saying, all right, if that's the case, then why are they not denying that they're true? Right. You know, and a good reporter should say that, going, all right, yeah, they could be. If we're saying, okay. Uh, John Podesta said this. He said that, and you know, she could be very easily a one or spokesperson to go. Nope, didn't happen. Never happened. You know, I, I, I challenge the veracity of these emails, but they're not. So as a reporter, you're going, wait a minute. If they're not denying that, this is fair game. 
and it is fair game. Okay. And and to jump off of Fox News saying, I guess I'm, I guess I'm changing up the subject a little bit. No, no, we have no they, back. Uh, they have great reporters. Uh, Griff Jenkins, yeah. uh, Major Garrett was with Fox News. Now he's with CBS. And Megyn Kelly was was a phenomenal uh, for the for the primary. She was a phenomenal moderator, right? And and Megyn Kelly's about the only primetime reporter with a TV show on, on any cable network. Well, she's it's interesting too. Just to let you get on, but right. I was thinking she's kind of stuck because you could tell that she wants to be treated as a as a journalist as a as a and if you work at Fox. The mainstream media do not see you particularly as as a true journalist or as a real journalist, and right. I'm not saying that's right because there are some people in there. I mean, certainly sure, Sean Hannity's not, and Bill O'Reilly's not, yeah. but but she's kind of stuck because she wants to be considered a a, a real journalist, and I think that she is. And know? by the way, she's getting a higher ha- uh, ratings than Hannity. Yeah, there there yeah. there's no love lost between them, but no. But you're right; there are some good reporters there, right? You know? But here here's where we get tripped up. Uh, Fox and MSNBC in particular, they're banking on their primetime opinion shows. Right. Uh, you have Chris Matthews, uh, Chris Hayes, the Chris's, uh, Rachel, Maddow. Rachel Maddow, Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC. You have O'Reilly, you have Hannity on Fox, you have The Five or whatever that show is. That show aggravates me. Not <laughs> that and outnumbered. Just, uh... Right. Well, all those shows aggravate me because... People are looking to that as news. I'm sorry, boys and girls. It's not news. It's opinion being presented in a form of a newscast. And I'll tell you, during when there is national breaking news, for example, uh, the uh, the Paris shootings or the riots, uh, right. I do go to Fox because they have excellent coverage when it comes to live breaking news. I'm not going to lie, they do. Um, so it's difficult to to, to separate. The, uh, the ideologies and the, the talking heads from right. real news, and they don't do a good. There's no there's no f- pry bar line in between them. They kind of fade in and out. And that's why with, you with know, breaking news too. There's also not as much time to opine on what's happening. Thank God. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean get O'Reilly out there going like, oh yeah, it must be a uh, you know. I mean, you don't have the time to say, oh, it must be a left wing conspiracy to do this. But this I mean, going back to my original point when you're talking about people who comment on websites and, and uh, after news stories and in Capital, I just had it out with someone on the Capital. I, I, I was telling you, I, I get sucked into it. I, I believe that you can you can debate. Civilly, I, right. I, I'm a big believer in that. There's been such a loss of civility in general in this country. There is, and I'm not blaming it on Donald Trump. I'm just saying that he is. The product no, that, of that started. That started before Donald Trump. I want to say it started good 10, 15 years ago. And okay, so let's blame Zuckerberg. Well, no, <laughs> it's not. I, I, I'm no, not, no, no this, to. we're talking about pre-Facebook. I mean, yeah. if you, what people think is news right now, what, what people like right now is they like the split screen on Fox with. Bill O'Reilly in one box and some other guy in the other where they're just screaming at each other. They don't want to watch Meet the Press on Sunday morning no. where you have a, a discussion. People don't like that. The lack of civility that we have in general is now bled into politics. It's not because of politics. That's just, that's a byproduct. That, of that's that. a byproduct. And I will say easily for the last decade, maybe 15 years, we have lost respect for institutions in this country. Specifically, the President of the United States... I mean, when you're having shoes thrown at you, when you're being called a liar by a congressman, I will say this too: I'm not, I am not uh, liberal, nor am I conservative. You know, so I you're an American. In, uh, no, but, yeah, exactly. But I mean, <laughs> looking at my voting, so I, I have some major problems with President Obama, major problems with the drones and what have you, and and, and uh, the Patriot Act and the domestic spying. That said, I have never seen a president more outwardly disrespected, and and especially in Fox News where he's being called a feckless. Uh, a feckless weakling in, right. a, in a, a debate where you, you have people calling him a liar. I'm not defending him, and I would say the same thing when, when people were calling out uh, George W. Right. When, you know, we'll say he's the bumper stickers, he's not my president. Well, then you don't know how civics works. Right. Because he is your president. You know, that, like him or not, or agree with him or not, have some respect for it. But I mean, this is just bled over into everything. It, it's. If you go to, and I, I wish I could just filter all that out, but well, I just I, can't. I I'll tell you, John McCain had, a, after. Trump and his at the debate, you know, I'll I'll let you know whether I want to concede or not, and I'll whether I'll accept it. I mean, McCain had a, just a very very powerful statement. He said, uh, "I didn't like the outcome of the 2008 election, but I had a duty to concede, and I did so without reluctance." Uh, a concession isn't just an exercise in graciousness; it's an act of respect for the will of the American people—a respect that is every American leader's first responsibility. 
I will say too that I. And by the way, one of the best concession speeches I've seen in yeah, history. It was because, he was a gentleman. Yeah, yeah an absolute was. gentleman. But I, and I will say this, but it, it's if you look at um, the civility of of of, of, of like the candidates themselves. It, it's absolutely appalling that, that you're seeing like you know they're not lie. even shaking hands. No, I mean that. I mean, Clinton, the Republicans wanted Clinton out of office like yesterday, but they still called him Mr. President. Right. They still shook his hand. The, what we're seeing now is just crazy. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I mean, I mean we, were, we were at Union Jacks watching the debate the other night and just sort of jokingly had some bets going like, "Well, are they going to shake hands?" And they didn't. You know, I mean, you, you were. And by the way, Saturday Night Live, they had a great, uh, when oh, they came yeah. out. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, let's shift off of the national thing a little bit real quick. Sure. And Because uh, you're deep into the politics of Baltimore, Maryland, and everything else. And we've got some more elections that are coming up. And I'd like to sort of pick your brain, sort of, I guess, from the state level down. I mean, we've got a, a longtime senator that we're replacing with, uh, Senator Barb Mikulski. Mm-hmm. And um, got some Congress people that are... How long has she been? She's 35 years? New yeah, Barbara? Yeah. I think 135. Yes. 135 she, she's been around for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a perfect example that everyone hates Congress, but everyone loves their congressperson. She's a perfect example of that. Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. You know, I, I, one of my neighbors said that the other day. She goes, uh, she goes, oh, she goes, they're all crooks. They're all crummy. And I hate them all. Well, except for Barbara. She's good. Like, yeah, yeah, she everyone has. says that in every district. Yeah, right. And she, and she has, it hasn't done a whole lot. I mean, she's broken a lot of glass ceilings. She's and and she's done well, um, but uh, you know, she's not this big, huge name maker coming out of Congress. Well, because uh, Maryland politics is not particularly exciting, to be honest with you. It's, no, it's fairly not. predictable. Well, no, it's well, you have Maryland uh, politicians in key positions in Capitol Hill. She was in charge of the uh, of a big committee in the uh, Senate right. when they had the majority. You have Steny Hoyer as a minority whip, um, and for a time he was majority leader. Um, hopefully that might get and only because uh, I'm a big Maryland guy but at some point I, I, I see Stinney, uh moving up if he so chooses as majority leader again um, but with that said Barbara is leaving a, definitely leaving a legacy 30 years as a senator and then a congresswoman before that right. uh, and her and many people don't know her claim to fame was stopping uh, a highway to go through uh, Little Italy in East Baltimore. Oh, I didn't know. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's that's how uh, her career got uh, got started. Uh, but now we're let's see, it's either Chris Van Hollen or Kathy Shalega. right? Whose name I always have a problem with. Shalega? is that? Well, it, they, it's a Polish name, and what my mom told me, one of her colleagues told her. The letters that don't make sense, you just remove those and just pronounce it. And then just go. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think Kathy Slag has got a really uphill battle. I don't think there's anything. She interest. does, and she's milking the Larry Hogan endorsement to no end. I mean, the Hogan endorse signs are almost as big as her uh, campaign. He's, have to, he's wildly popular. I mean, there's, uh, he, he's the most popular governor that I can think of since maybe Schaefer. I mean, he's got he's got better, better popularity ratings among Democrats yep. than O'Malley did among Democrats. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> O'Malley was not a popular governor. For, Cl- Plus fifty percent among Democrats, and Steve Robbie said it perfectly. I think it was no, it was Todd Everly. Okay. We're talking about sustained numbers. He's been in office for two years, and think about and we're, we're it's not it has nothing to do with cancer. And one of the uh, polls came out before he issued the executive order declaring the start of school for after Labor Day. <laughs> These are sustained numbers. He is, and he's not getting into the uh, partisan battles that. We've seen the Bob Early uh, jump into when he was governor, sure, yeah. and, and which wasn't which wasn't that contentious. I think. I mean, it was for Maryland, which is usually a pretty still pool. I, I think I read somewhere once. I don't know if it's true that Maryland has like the second or third most entrenched legislature in the country. I think behind Illinois, no, New Mexico and Louisiana. That sounds about right. I mean, a lot of a lot of the delegates and a lot of the state senators have been there forever. I was, John Astle, the state senator here in Annapolis, he's been in for at least thirty years that I could uh, remember off the top of my head. I think head. they just—they essentially just select their their uh, their successors. Right. Well, I, I think more. Hogan played this whole thing very well. I mean, with his non-endorsement of Trump, I mean, he came across said, "Hey, you know, Chris Christie's my candidate, and he's out, and That's my candidate's it. out." So you know, 
what's it to me? I'm, yeah, he's not good. Maryland. He took a little heat in some of the some of the red spots, like you know, Broadneck Peninsula and maybe the wet, out west, but not much. And really, Andy, because I think a lot of people in Maryland would, would kind of they're kind of moderate Republicans. They're going to kind of share his view on that, right? And keep in mind, you got to remember who his old man is. He led the charge to impeach Nixon. Yeah. So you you really see the independent streak in the junior, like you saw in the senior, where he said, "This isn't right. I'm I'm for impeaching Nixon." So do you think so? The third district. I mean, we're the most gerrymandered. It's the most gerrymandered district in, in the, the country. Right? Yeah, yeah. They are the pterodactyl. Was yeah, the uh, pterodactyl. But uh, I, there's there's some guy over in Bethesda or Montgomery County somewhere who's gotten his law degree. I think he's like in his sixties or something like that, just to challenge this, just to, just just to, uh, to to sue and challenge because he has standing uh, that his constitutional rights are that his freedom of speech is being um, infringed upon by this. Uh, I got a problem with it with with. The gerrymandering, um, just in principle, because I feel like that I'm not represented properly. Um, and, and Anne Arundel has had a history going back to the early '90s when Anne Arundel was within one congressional district. Then it got split to two, then two we got three, and now we're we're four. I'm sharing a representative with someone who's on the other side of Hagerstown. That's just that's incredible. I mean, I had some tax issues. I I was one of the guys who got my my. Uh, Social Security stolen, so I didn't get my refund. So, mm. and I, I struggled with this, with the IRS for just giving my freaking money. I mean, for <laughs> and it didn't happen for a year and a half. So I called um, my, my congressman, and, and there, he's like, "Well, you can come to." I mean, it was there's all these offices, but they just I got the impression they just seemed kind of disinterested. Maybe it was just my frame of mind. But I'm thinking, would this happen if I'm in a proper district instead of like this district that sprawls across the entire state? It's you know I don't feel like there's is he the guy that if I go to Western PA. Um, you know, my my uh, in laws, my 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 in laws. She died, so we had the funeral, and you had the the state representative there. Mm. You know, because he knew everybody in his district. And I just think in, in Maryland, you don't. Yeah, have we, that. Lose, we lose a, we lose a lot on that. Um, what about the? Uh, are you how up are you on the Anne Arundel uh, races that are for this? <laughs> he said, you mean Kevin? Yeah. Oh. There's not a real Kevin. I mean, there is yeah. a real Kevin, um, and he's a racist. Well, I know there are judges this year uh, in Anne Arundel County. Right. What am I missing? That's specifically, that's specifically what I wanted to get. And it's it's funny. People, I had somebody last night on Twitter. I said, who, who do I endorse? And I said, well, A, I don't endorse. Right. I said, but I will. I do have an opinion. And uh, I don't believe in the slates for judges. Now, we have four Republican candidates mm-hmm. running as a slate, uh, essentially as a unit. They're Hogan endorsed. Of course. According to their signs. Um, and we've got one... Judge is running as a Democrat. She won in the primary, was able to move on because she got the six or the, I guess the fifth lowest votes or whatever it may have been. And um, my my position, I said, I said, I I would, I don't care who you vote for, but just make sure that you vote um, for the one Democrat, just because I believe in diversity on the bench. I think we're looking at electing mm-hmm. people for twenty years, uh, which is a long time. I mean, I can, you know, if fifteen. Okay, right. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, but I, I'm like... Come on, John, do your research. If I can get somebody that has, uh, you know, a delegate, I mean, I can get rid of them in four years if, if they're that bad of a screw-up. Right. A lot more difficult to a judge who's interpreting these laws. I really don't want a slate of judges that all have the same opinions mm-hmm. sitting there sort of ruling down the same thing, whether it be all of the Fox News, you know, bent or the MSNBC bent <laughs> the same way. And I, I did the same thing with um, the last election cycle... When Allison Judge, she's now a judge, Allison mm-hmm. Asty ran against the slate of people because she wasn't part of the approved Democratic slate of judges, and Ron Jarishow ended up losing his seat. Uh, again, you know, was Allison Asty per- the most qualified? Perhaps not. Um, was it Cynthia Barber, I think. Is right. it? Claudia? Claudia. Claudia. It's Claudia Barber, who's, who's running on the you know, Is she the most qualified to serve in Anne Arundel County? Perhaps not, but I really don't think it's a fair well, slate. I think that has a... Personally, it, and this is uh, Kenny, the political scientist. I kind of have an <laughs> issue with Greek character, <laughs> cartoon. <laughs> Kenny, the mad political scientist. Yes, uh, but but to keep in mind, most of these judicial elections are normally decided in the primary. Very rare that, in fact, Baltimore almost had a situation where you have Councilman Jim Kraft. He's leaving. The city council. He went. He wanted to be a judge. He's since decided to back off of that. He he lost in the Democratic primary, 
but won in the Republican primary, and he was going to be on the ballot in November in the general election. I, I, so am I. Yeah. <laughs> it, it does get confusing. And if you're a registered independent like me, basically you don't really have a voice in judicial elections in Maryland. So I think it might be time to look at That's an interesting how point. to... Yeah, I never thought about that either. Because I'm, I'm also... Well, it's not independent. It's not right. affiliated in Maryland. But And just quick side note, too. I got in an argument with one of my friends about this, about the primaries, because we cannot vote in the primaries. Right. And I was really irritated by that. And one of my friends said, well, if you don't like it, then register as a Democrat and Republican and, and vote in the primary. I'm like, well, if you don't like it, then don't use my tax money to pay for your primaries. Because the, the, the Democratic and Republican, they're private organizations, and they're using public taxpayer money to run their primaries. I, that's my taxpayer and money. They're using taxpayer money to so use your own, use, use your own goddamn money to pay for your primaries. Yeah, and and that that and that goes to a well. I'm gonna just keep on the judges for right now. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that off my chest. That's... But but no, I mean, and then on top of that, and this came up in the panel last night. Uh, how can you really see what the judges can do? They don't allow cameras in the courtrooms in Maryland. It's not like, and it's not like anybody's clamoring to go to a courtroom unless it's a really really big trial. There, if we really want to uh, hold judges accountable, there has to be some changes made. The pro- the question is, who will have the political will to push for that? I mean, as a reporter, I would love to have cameras in the courtroom, especially since the Court of Appeals down the street, they stream their uh, hearings online. Right. And when I came down for uh, the, Freddie, the case involving the Freddie Gray uh, officers, uh WBAL Television, they provided the pull audio video. So why can't we arrange that for the circuit courts and the district courts? What's the rationale behind that? I mean, I know the Supreme Court, too. I, I think it's ridiculous in this day and age that we... That, first of all, I, the courtroom sketch artist union must be absolutely all-powerful, the fact that they, we still have people drawing pictures of... What uh, union? <laughs> but that's what I mean. I, I'm joking. What, what, is, what does it mean with that... that you can't stream video and audio from uh, from the courts. What's the point? Why can't you do? I mean, not all courts, but Supreme Court and right. I, it's just stupid to me. Well, well for Maryland, they at least uh, during the Freddie Gray trials, they said the. Uh, I mean, we can't even bring our cell phones into the courtroom. In fact, the first order of business was shutting your cell phone off. I had someone locally, uh, a friend of ours, who was working for the Patch at the time, and she tweeted. I think. She she did something during a uh, court proceeding where right. she tweeted, and she they charged her with contempt right. or they threatened to right. or something. Right? Yeah, no, they no, they charged her with contempt, and it was shit. Yeah, shit. yeah, yeah. And we we couldn't even live now during the Leopold trial. You could live tweet in the courtroom, but that be, that's because it was a bench trial. It was a totally different dynamic. But we couldn't even tweet. We couldn't even use our phones. Well, I mean, we, yeah, they, they made that judge made an exception for right. that specific trial too. Right. So. With all that said, I would love to see the rules guiding media access and how to report trials taken out of the hands of the administrative judges and have it have some rules laid out uh, by this by the General Assembly because times have changed. And ironically, Judge Barry Williams, who decided to keep the Freddie Gray trials in Baltimore, said people get their news differently. And I think we need to uh, recognize the fact that we also cover news differently, and people find out about judges and trials differently. So we, right. there definitely needs to be some rule changes as far as the Maryland judiciary. Hey, before before we wrap up here, okay, and you you were deep in the heart of Freddie Gray. Um, you've been in Baltimore for three and a half years now. Yes, uh, covering this. There was one name that came out of that whole Freddie Gray thing when I was following it from from afar down here in Anne Arundel mm-hmm. County. Brandon Scott. Okay, now take off take off the journalist hat and all this all this bullshit. I just want to know this this guy impressed the hell out of me throughout the Freddie Gray, and I followed him a little bit through the election and everything else. Um, where do you see Brandon Scott in Baltimore in five, ten, fifteen years? Well, first of all, where's where's he? Who's he well, work for? Well, Brandon He's a Councilman in yeah, Brandon Scott uh, is the city ca- Baltimore area, right? City Councilman. He represents a district in Northeast Baltimore. Uh, he is a great guy, and the same energy that you saw during the riots and after the riots was the same energy that I saw before. I mean, he is very involved in his district, very charismatic. He, he, I mean, he's young. He's what? Oh, yeah, thirty. 
He's 32. I'm older than him. You know, yeah. I'm 35. And you were talking. Uh, you were talking about him a couple weeks ago as a possible uh, disruptor, as a mayoral candidate. Way, way back when. I mean, I, I totally can see him. I personally, I totally can see him running for oh, mayor. Yeah. Yeah. I can see him. Oh, I, running I've for got on him about those cryptic messages because he made it seem that he was going to run for mayor, mm-hmm. and then lo and behold, he's just going to run for real life. So I'm like, dude. <laughs> but no, Brand, Brandon Starr is bright, and as long as he stays on the path. I could see him becoming a mayor or even a city council president at some point, depending on what he wants to do down the line. And he's and he's even uh, starting to realize how underpowered Baltimore is as a city in general. Uh, in the realm of Maryland. In the realm of Maryland. Yeah. Well, and uh, I'm and Matthew Crenson, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm looking forward to that book about Baltimore's power in uh, Maryland. But he realizes that. Because Baltimore can't exactly breathe on its own. He needs help from the General Assembly. And also keep in mind, Brandon is part of this uh, young group of new leaders that are emerging. And you'll really see them uh, when the new city council takes place. Shannon Snead, John Bullock, uh, disclaimer, he was my professor at Towson University. Uh, All these young, energetic and more progressive leaders that are about to step up. I mean, it's about to be, as a reporter and even as an observer of politics in general, it's going to be a fun time covering them in Baltimore. Baltimore, the emergence of a new Baltimore. That's kind of uh, that's kind of interesting. I'll tell you though that Brandon Scott just if I, if I move to Baltimore City, I'm, I'm moving into his district, and whatever I can vote for him, I'm going to vote for him because I he really impressed me. That I mean, anybody that could get kids on a Saturday morning to hand out flyers. To, about a job fair for the Horseshoe Casino. Kids, Saturday morning. Yeah. I can't get kids <laughs> to put their cereal bowl in the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. My That's about it. Yeah, he, sure. he has a bright star ahead. It, it, it's going to be real exciting to see where, where that goes. So okay, where I'm, I'm, I'm glad my instinct was on when I, when I saw that because I yeah. wanted to talk to somebody that was into the, into, the, uh, into the scene, if you will. Oh, yeah. So where do people find you? Uh, WIPR in Baltimore. Uh Technically, 88.1 in Baltimore, 88.1 in Frederick, and 106.9 on the Lower Eastern Shore in Ocean City. Look at that radio voice. How about that? WYPR.org and the app. Thank God for the pop screen, by the way. (laughs) Uh, And uh, I'm out and about. Just uh, on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at PKB News. Uh, KennyBurns.com if you want to see my past work. I think I have some NAV stuff up there. Definitely some WBAL and some CBS stuff. I used to contribute to them when I worked at WBAL. We drive the 76 Pinto. It's green. <laughs> if you ever see him running around, take a flash. <laughs> 2001 Nissan. Uh, now, as far as us, if you want to follow us, find us on Facebook at the Maryland Crabs uh, Facebook page. And we have a group as well. Also on Twitter, we're at MD Crabs Podcast. Nailed it. First time in there you go. shows. <laughs> And then email info at themarylandcrabs.com and the website, of course, themarylandcrabs.com. And you can find John at at Ian Annapolis and I'm at Tim Hamilton 47 on Twitter. And you can get us both on Facebook. We'll friend you. And We're very if, lonely. If you do go to uh, iTunes, that star immediately, the furthest right star, the one that lays up five one, of them, the fifth. give the five rating, take the time to... Leaves us kind words. Yeah, review. Kind of that really helps us out like a lot. Them. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell everyone all about us. Um, and take a look at the older episodes that we did. We had, we just had last week, we had Walter Vasquez, who owns uh, the Central Terrace. Terrace talking about the Latino community and what their impact is. Uh, uh, we still, people are talking about Robert Eads and, and uh, Jessica and Packler. And so, so if you haven't yet, go back and listen to them. They're, they're really fascinating. I'm checking out the Robert Eads one. Yeah, that was, that, was inter- that sounds interesting. Yeah, and of course, go see the Annapolis podcast. Our friend Scott McMullen, he's got, uh, he has Carl Snowden. It was his latest yep. episode. That's, uh, that's a really good one. So uh, we're just glad to see that the, the, that the podcast uh, community is starting to pick up and uh, hope to see some more coming and up soon. And, uh, and I want to thank Kenny Burns. Thanks, Kenny. Sorry, Pete Kenneth. Burns. <laughs> Thank you for from, having me. Uh, from coming all the way down from hell. He's living, living, living in Howard County, but yeah, I just in Baltimore, <laughs> all over the place as a reporter tends to be. But thank you very much for spending an hour with us. and It's been fun. Great. We'll this see you next time. This is the Maryland Crabs. We're out. This has been the Maryland Crabs podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? 
It's over. Go home. Go.